um, an icebreaker and then going right into um, planning your summer garden. So how to transition um, your garden from season to season and then um, moving right into plant identification. So how to identify a variety of different plants growing in your garden. So whether it's vegetables, weeds, herbs, and flowers, we'll be talking about that today. Um, summer garden care. So how to effectively care for your garden. So watering practices, pruning, trellising, um, and a little bit of pest ID and management. Um, then we'll um, finish up with our Q&A and then just wrap up. So for uh, today's icebreaker, um, we thought it would be fun for folks to drop right in the chat um, your name, preferred pronouns, um, learning garden school you are associated with. And then my favorite thing to eat this season is so your response to that right in the chat. Um, so while folks are um, filling up the chat, um, I can go first. <laughs> so Amina Behloul, she, her, hers, um, program coordinator with Big Green and um, my favorite thing to eat this season. And I've already told this to my Chicago team, it's gotta be mangoes, it's gotta be um, the smaller yellow Alfonso mangoes, those are super sweet right now. If you hadn't had mango yet, I would highly recommend. Um, we at my house are a two person household and for some reason, um, my husband is a fan that he decided to purchase two complete boxes of mangoes. <laughs> so there has been a lot of mango distribution and gifts going around to family and friends. So, um, it's mangoes in our household. So I'm seeing cucumbers, strawberries. So great, celery. That's an interesting one. Don't get a lot of celery. Cherries. More strawberries, more cucumbers. Ooh, I love all the suggestions. Tomatoes, mangoes, cucumbers, limes, arugula, all of it. <laughs> so great. So many options to choose from. So many great things growing this season. All righty. So we can go right into our workshop for today. So thank you all for participating. Um, so again, we are covering summer garden planning. So how to plan out your for your summer garden. Um, so the first image that you find above is our big green growing calendar. Um, and that is essentially the calendar that we follow when we're working with our schools. Um, so you can see from the calendar that the spring growing um, season stems from April all the way to mid-June. And then you have a whole bunch of transitioning happening, schools closing out, and summer gardens are starting from mid-June all the way to mid-September. So um, the summer garden um, is a longer growing season. And um, during this time, folks are transitioning their garden from um, cooler weather crops, so things like lettuce and arugula and spinach to more warmer climate crops like tomatoes and um, peppers. So plants that flourish in the heat. So um, transitioning your garden can be a multi-step process. Um, and we will be sharing with a video with you shortly that goes over each of those steps. Um, and it's really versatile and can be practiced from season to season. So it's not just exclusive from um, spring to summer. So let's go ahead and play that video. Whether you have been growing in your garden this past season or have had limited access to your garden, this session is for you. During this breakout session, we will be covering the process of putting your garden to bed for the season. 
Before any work can be done, it is very important to take a tour of your garden. This step will help reintroduce you into your garden space and allow you to assess all the work that needs to be done. Breaking up the duties can make the tasks seem a bit more manageable. On putting your garden to bed, you want to practice the five C's. Clean, clear, cultivate, compost, and cover. The first step in this process is to clean up your garden space. Be sure to come prepared with a trash bag and a set of disposable gloves. Start with the outside of the garden and make your way into each garden bed. Next is to clear out your garden beds. During this step, you will be clearing out plants ready for harvest, clearing out weeds and flowering plants, and pruning your perennials. When harvesting leafy greens, remove each leaf individually where the leaf meets with the main stem of the plant. Start your harvest with the outermost leaves first, slowly working your way inward. When harvesting greens, you can use your hands or a set of garden shears. For root vegetables, simply hold the leaves of the plant closer to the root, then twist and pull. When harvesting tomatoes and peppers, simply twist the fruit off the vine. When harvesting cucumbers, it is best to use a pair of garden shears to remove the fruit from the stem to avoid damage to the vine. When weeding a garden, it is best to equip yourself with a durable bag or garden truck for all of your weeds and a pair of garden gloves for any thorny plants. When weeding your garden, be sure to slowly work your way down to access unwanted plants from the base. With a firm hold, slowly twist and pull up. This method helps to effectively remove weeds from the root. Plants that have started to flower should be removed from your garden. This can be done by fully uprooting the plant. However, if the plant is a perennial, this method is not advised. For perennials that have started to flower, simply remove the flowers with a pair of garden scissors or pruners. Perennials are plants that come back season after season. At the end of the growing season, you may find that many of your perennial plants have grown quite considerably. Perennials can benefit largely from regular pruning. Do not uproot and remove your perennial herbs. Simply cut back with a pair of pruners. Once your garden beds have been cleared, it's time to cultivate. This process consists of breaking up and turning the soil. This task can be done with a cultivator, a shovel, or even a trowel. Be conscious of the irrigation line in your garden bed and work around your irrigation system when completing this task. You can also use your hands to break up and declump the soil. Once your soil has been turned, it is time to compost. Composting is vital to renewing your soil and your garden bed ecosystem. You will need three cups of compost for larger B and C beds, and one and a half cups of compost for smaller circular A beds. Be sure to thoroughly mix the compost in with the soil, then gently pat down to evenly layer the soil in your garden bed. The final step in this process is to cover the soil of your garden bed. This can be done with cover crops, or dried mulch. Today we are going to be planting a variety of cover crops in our cleared out garden beds. You should have a number of cover crop seeds available to you in your seed bucket and from garden distributions. This includes peas, oats, buckwheat, bush beans, and scarlet runner beans. 
For this bed, we will be using buckwheat. Buckwheat is planted by broadcasting, or by evenly sprinkling the seeds throughout the garden bed. After evenly distributing your seeds, ticker your seeds into the soil, slightly covering them. If it is too late in the season to plant cover crops, or for partially planted beds, it is recommended to lay down some dry mulch to cover your soil. Mulch, which may include dried twigs, dried leaves, or even wood chips, can help protect exposed soil from the elements. Don't forget to water your seeds. This can be done with your irrigation system or done manually. And that is how to put your garden to bed for the season. Thank you for joining us today. Great. Thank you. Um, so that video was made um, with the intent of going over how to put your garden to bed, so how to close your garden up for the season, but it still applies when you're transitioning your garden from one season to the next. Um, whether you have elected to grow a vegetable garden this summer or a cover crop garden this summer, all of those um, steps of the five C's still apply. Um, so one thing I will say, and we can move on to the next slide, is um, transitioning your garden um, can look very different depending on how you and your school community, um, your school growing community decide that you want to implement the five C's. Um, so you have a number of options available to you. Um, option one um, is clearing your entire garden um, of vegetation and plants that are growing minus the herbs. So that means that you're uprooting and pulling out all of the plants. So if you have planted this past spring season um, and you've still got some lettuce growing in your garden, um, that you're gonna uproot those lettuce plants um, and um, work from kind of a, a clear slate but you are leaving all of your herbs growing in your garden. So that means your rosemary, your thyme, oregano, and sage. Um, you wanna leave, be sure to leave those in your garden bed um, because those are perennial and they will come back. Um, and then from there, you can go ahead and plant your summer garden. Um, so a complete turnover from season to season. Um, the next option looks a little bit different. Um, and that is option two, um, and that is interplanting. So basically when we say interplanting, that means that you are planting a variety of different crops within the same bed. So say for instance, you did plant in the spring and you still have a lettuce plant that is not, has not grown to full maturity and you would like to keep it in your garden and wait um, until you can harvest it um, to its full potential, you can absolutely decide to leave those plants in your garden beds and um, plant some summer crops around those spring plants. So interplanting your spring crops um, with some of your summer crops. And then um, when it's time to uproot those um, spring crops, you can plant some more summer crops and have a little successional planting going on in those garden beds. And then the final option would be a, a combination of both of those methods. So that may mean that in one garden you, bed, you decide that you want it to be completely clear and pull out all of um, your spring plants, while in another garden bed, you decide, um, I wanna keep some of these plants and allow them to continue to grow and plant some um, some summer um, crops in that bed. So um, your gardens and transitioning your garden can vary depending on what 
you decide as your school growing community and what best fits um, in your garden. So I as you- quick example? Yeah. Um, so like uh, radishes, for instance, would be like a perfect example of like, if you had a bed of radishes, you'd want to harvest all of those and that would be completely uprooting all of your plants and that would be a bed you're starting from scratch. But say you have um, kale that you planted in early spring and that's still producing well, those would be plants you'd want to strategically leave and um, kind of work. You could harvest them all, of course, and plant something else, but um, those would be good examples of plants you'd want to maybe interplant around. Thanks, yeah, Amina. Yeah. So um, as you are working and deciding on how you want to transition your garden, um, we're asking folks to um, be a bit cautious and mindful of all the different plants that are growing in your garden, um, especially for folks that may have planted um, garlic in the winter. Um, so your garlic should be coming up um, now. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and it should be ready to harvest in July. Um, so this is what um, uh, ready to harvest garlic um, looks like. You can see um, uh, the leafy sheaths on the side, um, closer to the bulb, but kind of dying out, um, but still present because they're protecting that garlic, um, making sure that you, um, during your transition process and clearing out and cleaning, um, that you're not removing those leaves. Um, and um, you can definitely plant around um, your, your garlic until it's ready to harvest in July and then plant some more su summer um, crops that can go in its place once it's harvested. One more tiny little piece with the garlic too is you'll also start seeing garlic scapes coming up. Um, I've been seeing folks who have been planting garlic post pictures of scapes that are popping up now. I haven't seen them in my garden yet, but really soon in the next couple of weeks, you'll see scapes emerging. So that's the flower stalk of the garlic. And once it curves around, you should be harvesting that. Um, and it is delicious. It tastes like garlic. And then that will encourage the plant to create a larger bulb for you to harvest later in the season. Um, Probably, yeah, at least in July will be about when the mid July will be when those garlics will be ready to harvest. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, so, moving on to our actual summer garden plan. So, the plan has not changed, um, it's similar to previous um, years. Um, and you'll notice this is a summer um, garden, vegetable garden um, plan. Um, we've allotted space for folks to plant, in addition to vegetables, um, flowers, and perennial herbs as well. So our vegetable garden is to broken up into three main parts. And we can talk more about that, yes. So our summer vegetable garden is broken into our salsa garden, our three sisters garden, and our plant parts garden. Um, so uh, our salsa garden this year are gonna have is gonna have a variety of uh, two different varieties of tomatoes, two different varieties of peppers, one hot, one sweet, an onion, and then cilantro from seed. Um, our three sisters garden is going to have the same corn, beans, and squash. So there's um, zucchini that you can plant as well as some summer squash that can be planted. Um, and then in our plant parts garden, it's a combination of some root vegetables and then leafy greens. Um, much of the root vegetables in that garden are from seed and then some of the leafy greens come as seedlings. So we're talking about collards, kale, and chard. And then a nice addition that we had um, in our plant parts garden um, going on two years now is our sweet potatoes. So those are coming back as well and will be made available to you. Um, so something to consider and um, just quickly, I know some folks are um, uh, talking about, um, have kind of talked about um, 
uh, customizing their um, summer garden plan, uh, which we are always excited to hear schools doing. So making some modifications, additions, what works best for their schools, adding um, more additions to the salsa garden, adding an extension to the three sisters or just more veggies. Um, and we love hearing those stories, but um, as you're working with your garden team, just things to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, and I know that we've kind of briefly talked about this in previous workshops and we'll just touch quickly on it. Um, this topic is a very big, big topic and if folks are interested in it, we can definitely hold um, a workshop exclusively about this, but companion planting. So um, being a little, a little bit conscious of what plants work best with each other and some plants that don't work best uh, very well with each other. So taking a look at this um, tomato plant, um, we see on the left, it's growing beautifully with parsley, garlic, basil. Um, those are tomato and nightshades companions. Um, and then on the right side, you can see that our tomato plant is not as happy um, when it's paired with things from the brassica family. So things like fennel and broccoli and cabbage. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, uh, the, uh, both of those families of plants um, fight for the same resources, introduce the same pests to the same garden bed. So just kind of thinking of, um, of that when you're creating new additions or substitutions in your garden. Um, and you can definitely feel free to reach out to myself and Sam um, if you are um, designing up a new garden plan or just had a quick question about um, some plant pairings or groupings. Um, so as you are planning out and prepping your garden, another thing to consider um, oh, uh, so just quickly before we talk about the next item is for folks that, um, oh, we can go back to the cover crops, um, are folks that have elected to um, uh, 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 plant a cover crop garden this, this year, um, sweet potatoes will be made available to you. And um, just being mindful of, um, the growing placement that um, we've indicated on our map here. Um, so I'm looking at things like sunflowers and nasturtiums. Um, so sunflowers, um, as you can see from the map, uh, were, are planted um, at the middle of the garden bed, just to kind of ensure that um, um, a plant as tall as a sunflower is not shading other plants um, in the same bed and they have received sufficient sun. And then um, our nasturtiums are planted at the edge of the garden bed. So um, nasturtiums can grow really big and like to um, kind of spread out. So planting them at the edge of the garden bed ensures that that um, happens. Um, so, um, and then just some, and we can go to the next slide. Um, I know we touched a little bit about companion planting, but as you are planning out your garden, regardless of whether you are deciding on planting a vegetable garden or a cover crop garden, something to keep in mind um, is crop rotation. Um, so crop rotation is a practice in which you are rotate, rotating um, different plant parts um, throughout your garden. So that means that um, leafy greens are rotated throughout the garden or fruit um, or even um, roots are rotated throughout the garden. Um, so rotation, um, and Sam is gonna talk a little bit more about how this can help manage with pests and it can help um, with um, soil health as well. Um, and much of that has to do with a lot of the different plant parts have different needs when it comes to garden, the garden and nutrients. So leafy greens require a lot of nitrogen, roots require a lot of phosph phosphorus, and fruits require a lot of potassium. So having kind of the rule of thumb of um, whether you plant um, in your learning garden every season or just kind of on an annual basis, um, rotating it out, um, your garden bed every season or, or 
every year. Um, so that means year one or season one, you're planting leaves in a, in a specified garden bed. And then following that, you're gonna switch it out for roots the next season or next year. And then fruits um, that following season or following year, and then the cycle continues. Um, so that will ensure that your um, garden soil remains healthy and pest management remains um, um, at an optimal level. So um, that means that if you are planting um, collards in one garden bed um, the following season, you may want to switch it up with carrots or radishes instead of kale. So just being mindful of that. Um, as you're working and planning out your garden. And just one final thing to my cover crop gardeners. And we're just gonna wait for the next slide. Great, so for those of you who are not um, going to be growing a vegetable garden and have elected to grow a cover crop garden. Um, there are many benefits to growing a cover crop garden, um, but um, because it is so low maintenance, this does not require you to water your garden. Um, so for that, you are essentially closing out your garden for the season until comes fall. So in that case, we are kindly asking schools who are growing a cover crop garden to properly um, store their hoses. So making sure that all of their hoses are completely emptied out of water um, and completely drained out and um, inspected for any holes or tears in all of your garden um, equipment um, uh, during this final close out. And um, just doing a quick walkthrough through your garden. And if you require any, um, um, have any maintenance requests or have any repair needs in your garden, note it, noting it and contacting either myself or Sam so we can um, slowly make ourselves um, to your garden through the summer growing season so that when you come back um, in the fall and decide to grow again, you are ready to go. So, all right, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Sam, who's gonna walk us through our next section of plant ID. Thank you so much, Amina, that was great. Um, so one of the most common questions that we get are what is this plant? Um, like we get all kinds of, uh, all kinds of pictures that texted to us, emailed to us, questions about this plant looks like this. Um, and so we wanted to spend a little bit of time just helping to go through some of the basic plants we have and IDing them in the garden. We're gonna start with a little quiz just to kind of, and have a little learning opportunity quiz at the beginning. Um, and then we're gonna go into some of the botanical ways that you can start thinking about plants so that you can have a little bit, um, little bit more vocabulary to start comparing plants to each other and getting to know your plants, just what to look for when you're looking at plants. So you can start to think about um, getting to know what plants are growing, not just in your garden, but all around you um, in the city, if you go on walks by the beach or in the woods, anytime you're in nature, getting a sense of, of what, what are the plants that you're looking at? How do we identify them? So here are, um, two pictures from our gardens, um, common herbs that we grow. You can go ahead and um, type them into the chat or uh, if you have a guess, I know the picture quality isn't great, but um, see how you did. We have basil and cilantro. Next ones. These are also herbs. Yeah, a lot of you are getting the sage over here. We've got mint and sage. Mint and basil and sage are all in the same family. So there's some similarities. They both have 
kind of similar leaf shapes, similar patterns on the stem. We're going to talk about that later. These are getting more into some vegetable. Ms. McIntyre, you've got it. Those are turnips and collards. My, those collards could be cabbages or broccoli, but those are collards. And yeah, I can see these turnips looking like radishes, but um, I'll actually get to some of the ways we distinguish, we can distinguish radishes from turnips when we get a little bit further on in the presentation. These ones I think are pretty obvious. That one on the right is just, I've, I actually have never seen a carrot pop its head out of the garden like that, but. Um, and this one, this one is not charred. I see a lot of charred comments in the in the chat. Charred and this plant are cousins. They're they're related. They're in the same family. But you can see down here at the bottom at the base. You can see it's a beet, um, right? That beet root is popping its shoulders up out of the shoulder, just like the carrot is. Um, and and yeah, beets and Swiss chard are are almost the exact same plant. One has been bred to produce just leaves and stems that we eat and not really the root. And beets, you can eat the leaves, the stems, and the root. Um, so that's, that's great. And they all come in different colors, which is really, really awesome to be able to plant and see those different kind of showy colors in the garden. Now we've got a bunch of flowers. These are common in all of our gardens. We've been planting them for several years. Um, we really are encouraging people to interplant a lot of flowers in with their vegetables. Um, help support pollinator habitats, create diverse, um, biodiverse uh, habitats in our gardens to support bringing lots of insects into our garden um, and create a little bit more balance in our in our urban ecosystem. So I don't know if anybody would like to unmute and if anyone's feeling confident they want to go and identify all five of these. All right, that's okay. Let's. I'll. I'll. I'll expose. I'll. I'll. I'll bring the answers in. We've got. Got a lot of. A lot of really good guesses here. So these are zinnia up at the top left. Um, they can look like marigold flowers, but they're when you see them in the garden, they'll be much taller than many marigold. Um, many marigold varieties, but marigolds can grow tall too. The, all these. Also, these colors are really um, indicative of of zinnias, as well as these opposite leaves and the pointed leaf shape. We really, zinnias are amazing. They bring a ton of, butterflies love zinnia. You'll see a lot of butterflies fluttering around um, your zinnia plants. Down here, these are nasturtium. You can see they're vining with all these pretty round leaves and orange flowers. The leaves and the flowers of these are edible. Here's centaria, also known as bachelor buttons. Um, those flowers are also edible. And over here, we have uh, sunflower girasol. And, um, also an edible, a wonderful edible flower that we eat its seeds. And I've actually seen if you Google um, sunflower recipes, there's I've seen some people grilling the whole sunflower head so that's immature and you can you can eat a whole grilled sunflower uh, head. Um, I haven't tried it myself yet, but I've seen a bunch of videos. I'm looking forward to trying it myself this summer. So now let's get into some of the things that we really need to look at when we're comparing plants. Um, we're gonna talk about leaves and, and flowers because I think they're the most clear and obvious parts of the plant to look at when we're comparing and contrasting the plants that we're seeing in the garden. Um, as you're out in the garden, these are the things to pay attention to on the plants and say, oh, this basil has a, uh, uh, elliptic shaped leaf. And you don't have to know these botanical names. I don't know, I don't have these names memorized for leaf shapes or for margins, right? I'm not gonna go to my uh, lemon balm and be like, oh, is this is this a, a crenate leaf margin leaf or is this serrate, like, right? But I do notice this is the pattern, this is the shape, this is, this is the way that this, look, leaf, this leaf looks. And so when we're comparing, and contrasting our leaves together, we can start to see some of these differences. So I'm gonna go back really fast to these herbs. Here you can see 
the shape of the mint plant and the kind of serrated edge. And then when we go back one more to basil, you can see it's, it's not really clear. We're not close enough to see, but the basil, it's in the exact same family as the mint, but its leaf is smooth. The edge of the leaf is, is completely smooth. So again, like just like subtle differences um, that you can start to pick up on that will really help us to be able to, um, to understand and get to know what is happening in the garden when it comes to identifying plants. Next, I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about um, the mint family plants is the way that the leaves are arranged on the stem. Um, so alternate leaves are arranged where one leaf comes out, one node um, at a time, and one will go to one side and the next leaf will be up farther up on the stem in another direction and the next leaf will be farther up on the stem in another direction. Opposite leaves are two leaves are coming out side by side from the stem at the same spot along the stem. And then there's two kinds of opposite leaves. So this one towards the left is uh, two ranked opposite leaves where they're in the same direction going up the stem. And then opposite leaves, four ranked, is where they alternate, giving the plant a little bit more, opening up more room for more sun to get down deeper into the canopy so the leaves aren't shading themselves. Um, every plant in the mint family, you'll notice. So. Um, the basil, the mint, the oregano, the sage have opposite four, four leaf, uh, sorry, opposite four ranked leaves. World leaves, um, I don't know, I can't think of any world leaves that we grow currently in, in our vegetable gardens, but a lot of perennial um, and annual flower plants have some world, world leaves. The other thing you wanna be looking at is texture. I mentioned distinguishing the difference between turnips and radishes. Um, those plants can look similar when you plant them both in the garden and you're walking around. The leaves have kind of a similar shape, um, but the textures of those leaves are very different. Radishes have very rough, um, rough leaves. They, you can feel like almost like hairs, um, like they're not thorns at all, but they're rough. Um, and, and turnip leaves are a little bit bumpy, but they don't have that really coarse roughness to them. And so even though they, both have those shoulders of the roots popping up out of the soil. They're colored purple or red. Um, their leaves are similar green shapes, similar sizes, similar kind of crinkled texture. But when you feel them, you can, you can really feel it. If you looked at them really closely under a microscope, you would see um, difference in the hairs on the leaves. Next is flowers. So depending on what season you're in or what point in the life cycle of the plant, you might not have a lot of leaves to look at to compare. Um, if you're growing kale or collards last fall and they lived through the winter and now they're, you know, five feet tall and full of these bright orange flowers, you might not see any leaves at all on those plants. You might just be looking at the orange, at the yellow flowers. Um, and so starting to think about what are the exact details of these flowers you're looking at. What's the shape of the flower? How many petals are there? Um, are they, how are they symmetrical? Are they symmetrical down the middle? Are they symmetrical in like thirds? Um, paying a lot of close attention to not just the color, but the shape of the flowers. Of course, you can get really detailed and look at the, all of the way that the reproductive organs work and the glands and all of those things, but we don't need to get that detailed, right? Let's just keep it simple acknowledge that flowers look different, and then start to think about, are there names for this? Or are there ways that you as a teacher can start to recognize different parts of the flowers, different shapes of the flowers, different colors of the flowers? What are the words you can use to describe, um, describe the parts of the, of the flowers? Over here, like you can see on the pea-like flower, um, there's a banner, there's a wing, there's a keel. Like some that vocabulary can help you when you're talking with students to help them start to feel a connection to the natural world, um, start to be able to feel like they can see the plants around them, that it's not just a plant, it's a very specific plant that has very specific characteristics. Um, and then here, this last slide, um, and we will be sharing this out and we'll be having all of these links pulled out for you in our blog post that we put in the chat earlier, but um, all of these pictures came from our visual vegetable plant guide. Um, we also have a Midwest 
common Midwest weed guide. Um, those are really great documents for you to print, have them laminated, bring them out into the garden with you um, and, and use them to, to help identify plants if you don't know what they are. Um, there's also some really great apps. Um, Picture This and iNaturalist can help you to take pictures and identify plants in the garden. Um, and then there's some really great resources. So the, all of the content that I shared at the end, those botanical photos of different shaped leaves, those came from this UC Davis course. Um, and then there's also a great extension uh, website that um, comes out of Colorado that has a lot of this kind of more botanical information. What are the specific names? How do you characterize different leaf shapes? What are the things that you're looking at if you'd like to go a little bit deeper? Um, but just to, again, to reemphasize, I don't, I'm not really encouraging all of you to, you know, go out and get a, a doctorate or PhD in botany and like really go deep and understand all of the names of the different ways of classifying leaves and flowers and stems and roots, but just, just getting a sense of what to look for when you're looking at the leaves, when you're looking at the flowers, when you're looking at stems, um, so that you can start to, to see the differences between the plants and be like, oh, this beet looks almost the same as Swiss chard. Here's why, here's like the, the texture of the leaf, here's the shape of the leaf, here's the, the shape of the stem, here's, here's the root structure that's different, right? Like those are all of the things that um, we'd really encourage you to look at and to, to start to talk um, with your students and share these things, these observations when you're out in the garden. All right, so moving on. Oh, whoops, I didn't mean to click the link. The basics of summer garden care. So here we're gonna talk about watering, we're gonna talk about trellising, we're gonna talk about pruning, we're gonna talk about some of the basic things that you're gonna be able to do in the garden this summer to help maximize your production, make sure that the garden is really um, producing well for those of you who are um, actively caring for and growing food, food and your flowers in your gardens this summer. Um, so some general, these are basic tips that should apply to everybody. Water your garden when it's cool, it's best in the early morning or the early evening. Um, I would say if you have a chance, if you can choose, the morning would be best because it makes sure that your leaves are dry by the time evening comes. It helps protect your plants from especially fungal diseases, but all kinds of pathogens that can make your plants sick. Um, and then the, my other caveat to that is if the only time that you can go and water is at noon, by all means, if the plants are thirsty, water any time of day. Um, water at one in the morning, water at 12 in the afternoon, it does not matter if the plants are thirsty, they need water. Um, you know, you can think about yourself. We need to hydrate ourselves throughout the day. If we're thirsty, we're thirsty. The plants are the same. Um, deep and infrequent watering is better than shallow frequent watering. Um, this is because you wanna train the roots to grow deep. Um, if the roots are used to moisture being six to eight inches deeper in the soil, because that's as the water on the surface of the soil dries and the roots go down and they search and they grow deeper to search out and, and access that water, they're also going to be accessing more nutrients in the soil. They're going to have a larger, more, more developed root system. If you're just always watering shallowly, frequently, many times a day for a little bit and the water is only really moist at the surface, the roots don't have to grow deeper. They don't have to get bigger. They can just be like, all right, we're cool. We don't have to stretch ourselves out. Um, so really encourage those large root systems to grow with the deeper and frequent watering. That doesn't mean don't water for two weeks. That just means, you know, maybe water every three days, um, water when the, when the garden needs it, not necessarily every day, no matter what, all the time. Um, when the weather is hot and when the weather is windy, plants will, um, will have much higher rates of respiration. They'll be pulling a lot more water out of the soil to keep themselves hydrated. So on those days when it's 90, even two times a day might be necessary to keep the plants really, really happy and um, growing fast, growing well. Um, of course, if you can't make it out to water on those days and you come back the next day in the water, the plants are limp, you shouldn't have to worry too much. You can revive them with a nice deep watering. Um, but yeah, keep your, keep your eyes on, on your plants, especially on those really hot days. They're really going to be, be thirsty. Um, use an irrigation timer if you can. If you can leave your hoses out and have a timer going and let your garden be watered every morning for you, no matter what, 
it will take a huge load off on the amount of labor it takes to take care of the garden, um, make watering schedules if you can. There's a link here to our watering page on our website that has watering schedule templates and letters and things like that that we've already crafted for you that you can just adapt for your own needs. And then the last thing I'm gonna say is use your fingers. Um, if you don't know if the garden needs water, stick your finger in the soil. And if it is dry, it needs water. If it is, if it is moist, you could probably go a day without it and keep your eye on the forecast um, and have that garden well watered, especially if hot weather is coming. Can I just pruning. add something? Yeah, go ahead, Amina. Thanks. Um, so just to give folks an idea of watering, when you're watering, especially top watering, 30 to 50% of the water is lost due to evaporation. So you might have watered, you're, you're feeling good about watering your garden and um, much of that water is not received by your plants. So um, we always tell our schools, you're more likely to underwater than overwater. So if you can do it, like, as Sam is stre stressing, um, please do, thanks. All right, thanks so much, Amina. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so pruning is something that I think a lot of people are intimidated by. Um, it's something you can mess up, right? Like it's easy to cut a stem or a leaf or a flower off of a plant, but you can't put it back on, right? Glue and tape won't, won't help us um, here. And so we wanted to start with the plants that are most basic to prune um, and give you some guidance for helping to support your plants in ways that will make them more productive. So we're not just pruning just because, the reason why we're pruning our plants is really twofold. One is to control their size so that they're more manageable, um, so that there's more access to sunlight, there's more access to air. Um, they, can, they can grow in ways that are, are more healthy for those plants and are easy for you as a gardener to care for them. Um, and also the way that we prune the plants can encourage them to produce more fruit as opposed to more herbaceous growth, more um, leaves and stems. So let's start with tomatoes. It's kind of maybe the, maybe the best plant to start your pruning experience on if this is something that's new for you. Um, and there's two kinds of tomato plants. There's determinant and indeterminate. An indeterminate tomato plant or indeterminate of, of any plant will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until the season tells it that it's time for it to die or its life cycle tells it that it's time for it to die. Um, it, it will, an indeterminate tomato plant could be 12 feet tall. Um, a determinate plant grows to a certain size, produces flowers and fruit, completes its life cycle and dies. So it will only grow depending on the, the variety of plant maybe three feet tall, it will produce its flowers and that's it. And so we don't wanna prune those determinant plants because we want them to be as big as they're gonna get and have as many branches as they're gonna have. They will stop growing, they're almost self pruning, right? Not really pruning, but they determine how large they're gonna get. For an indeterminate plant in our learning garden, those can be a little bit unwieldy. Um, and you, know, you could have a, a tomato plant that's brawling all over the place, falling over, knocking over your trellis um, or your tomato cage. And so those would be plants that you'd really wanna think about pruning. So to do that, let's look at this diagram here. Um, up the main stem, you will see large, these large compound leaves, they're alternate, growing on either side of the stem one at a time. And then in right here, it's called the axle, or I think of it as a node, in between the stem and the leaf, is this sucker. And here you can see it in this box over here on the left. And that sucker is the sucker that you want to be pruning off. If that goes unpruned, you will then have a tomato plant with two branches. And then on the next, on the next leaf, you'll have another branch coming out. And on the next leaf, you'll have another branch coming out. And so over the course of an entire summer, you might have a tomato with 15 or 20 branches going off in all directions, getting larger and larger and bushier and bushier. And rather than the plant focusing on growing bushier and larger, you want it to focus on these flower clusters. You want those flowers to develop. You want more flowers to develop. You want the plant to put its energy into producing fruit. Um, so by pinching off those suckers right where they're coming out of this main stem, excuse me, you're gonna encourage the plant to produce more. 
The same thing with peppers and cucumbers. Cucumbers also on their vines produce those suckers at the same node where the leaf comes out. Um, although on cucumbers, a flower and a leaf and a sucker will all come out at the same spot. And so identifying where that sucker is and breaking that off can help control your cucumber plants. Um, and pepper plants can benefit from once they're pretty mature, if you pinch off the top leading, um, leading node, the top, um, it's called the meristem, the main stem, it will, uh, it will encourage the plant to be bushier so that the plant will get larger and bushier and produce more flowers and more peppers. So depending on the plant, you will slightly alter your um, pruning techniques. But if this, is, if this is something that you're new to, I would recommend starting with a tomato plant. Um, and obviously just a quick Google search looking for like pepper, pepper pruning, you will see many videos of, of lots of gardeners sharing, sharing their tips. Next, again, in kind of thinking about controlling our plants is trellising. Um, so especially plants with heavy fruit, I'm talking about tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants, peppers, um, and, and then even thinking about vining plants. So I mentioned cucumbers, but pole beans all really require vertical support. This helps the plant stay off the ground and stay healthier. It also um, helps us use more space wisely in the garden so that plants are growing up vertically instead of across the soil, making room for us to grow more. Um, cages are a simple, easy solution for tomatoes. I would not recommend tomato cages for an indeterminate plant. They, the plants will quickly be double the size of any tomato cage, but for a small determinant plant, a tomato cage will work fine. Um, I would also recommend if you're using cages for a tomato to secure um, some extra stakes around the cage too, to help bolster it and make sure it's secure. Once, you know, if we're in August and the plant is weighed down with fruit and we get some really heavy windy days, it's easy for that plant to just knock the whole trellis over. And so securing it with some, some more sturdy stakes can help make that um, really strong. The last thing I wanna say before we move on to the next slide, we're gonna be talking about trellising for the next couple of slides, but install this trellis when the plant is young, um, ideally right when you've planted it. Put the tomato plant in the ground, put your trellis system or whatever you're using over it. Um, it is going to be nearly impossible to get a trellis around a plant once it's mature. And so having it in place that you can tie the plant to or help train it up against the trellis while it's growing is much better for your plant and for your sanity. Here are some other examples to use stakes on these peppers. Here you can see these larger cages around these eggplants. That might be a little bit overkill for that eggplant, um, really sturdy, but you know, I would say really probably a cage like that would be beneficial if it was taller for something like a tomato that needed a little bit more sturdy support. Creating trellises is a great opportunity to use what you have. Um, finding sticks, here you, were, you can see some bamboo poles that are used. Um, you can see these bean plants winding their way up the, up the, the bamboo pole here. Um, and twine working well to tie plants up to those trellis is a great idea. Another plant support idea is using other plants as support for our vining plants. So here's an example of a Three Sisters garden where the corn plant is the trellis for the bean plant. Um, they're working together and the bean plant in this um, amazing companion planting system that goes back um, you know, about 10,000 years, I'd say. Um, the bean is feeding and supporting the corn just as the corn is providing that structural support for the, the bean. Um, other examples of tall plants that provide structure and support for other plants would be a sunflower. Um, so planting those plants first, getting them growing, giving them a start, and then planting the climbing plants next to them after they've already gotten a little bit of growth can, can help to really um, provide some of that, that vertical structure and support in your garden. We have seen this a lot all over the city. I see it in my garden sometimes when it gets away from me. Um, if you're not tying up your plants, it encourages a lot of disease. And here's an example of a cucumber that was against the soil um, and probably some wet conditions. And maybe there was some mold already in the air and it's encouraged rot of the, the fruit. Um, I really see that a lot with tomato plants. Um, 
in in any circumstance when plants are are down and laying on the ground, especially when it's wet, it encourages a lot more disease from the soil. And so using mulch to help keep the soil and the plants separated and using trellising system um, and vertical supports to help keep your plants elevated is gonna help keep plants healthy. Here's some other examples of what these can look like. I think maybe, I hope everybody's getting the ideas of the way that these can be some really great STEM challenges for young people in the garden. Um, using materials that are available around the schoolyard, around the school, what can students bring from home? Um, what design ideas do students have of how they can themselves construct, engineer, design, troubleshoot, work with the plants themselves, to understand how to build a, a structure that's gonna do really well. Um, here you can see this cucumber plant on the left, this um, like A-frame, uh, this A-frame trellis. The really great idea here is planting some shade loving crops like, um, like lettuce underneath the shade of the cucumber that's growing up the trellis. Another kind of good connection for students as they're thinking about the way plants work and, um, and, and the different functions and structures of the plant parts themselves is the, the tendrils that grow on a lot of our vining crops and how they work. Um, the tendrils are really amazing. They, when they touch, when the cells on the, the one side of a tendril touches something, it tells the other cells on the other side of the tendril to grow more so that it wraps itself around whatever the side of the, the the tendril is touching. Um, really cool to examine the way that plants have evolved over time to help themselves stay up off of the ground when there's something for them to hold on to. And again, being creative, this is a uh, great shot from Washington Irving Elementary. Um, a great teacher there, MC, found a bunch of twigs on the side of the road one day and threw them in her trunk and brought them to school and her students spent uh, a morning and built this, this arch structure in their garden that they were growing peas up. Um, and if you're gonna grow something like this, again, like make sure that this would be, an, I said before, plant and then add the trellis. This would be an example of build the trellis and then plant the seeds next to the trellis, right? The, the work of build, building the trellis might, might destroy the plant that you're trying to grow. Um, especially if you're doing it as a class project. So think about the order of operations and kind of what kind of structures, what kind of trellises you're gonna be putting in place. It might be more helpful to plant the plant first and then put the trellis around it. It might be more helpful to build the structures first and then plant right next to them. All right, and we're gonna have time for comments and questions at the end as well. So. We're gonna get into pests a little bit. Pests can be an issue in the garden, um, but I'd like for us to think maybe a, not necessarily of insects living the garden as pests so much as they are part of the habitat that we have created in the garden and that you as a gardener have the ability to manipulate and control the environment in the garden in a way that supports biodiversity and helps to support our plants and the insects that eat them and the insects that eat those insects to have um, a balance in the garden. How do we find that balance? Um, aphids here, you can see in this picture, are very common pests that we find on our brassicas, on our kale, broccoli, collard families. Um, and they love, you'll see them at the top of the plant where the new growth is coming in. They love to suck the juices out of those new tender leaves. Um, you'll, you'll see the plants starting to yellow, starting to wilt, starting to look old. Um, and when you flip the leaves over, you'll frequently see patches just like this in the photograph of, of lots of aphids. Um, controls, you can blast them off with water. Sometimes people like to use an insecticidal soap, but use caution with that because it kills all insects. Um, another tip is just, just let them be if they're not overwhelming the plant because wasps will come and eat them, ladybugs will come and eat them, ladybug larvae um, and lace wings are amazing predators of these aphids. So again, if it's not overwhelming your plants and you know that you've seen wasps or ladybugs in the garden, you can just let them be. The plant will tell the other bugs, the predators, that it's having some issues with aphids. It'll send out some pheromones and the insects will come and they will eat up the aphids. 
Um, of course, if it's getting overwhelming, you want to deal with it. Next, we're going to talk about the tomato hornworm. They are a caterpillar of the hawk moth. It's a really beautiful moth, but these caterpillars will completely eat all of the leaves on a tomato plant in a couple of days. They're really voracious eaters. Um, mostly tomatoes, sometimes potatoes, eggplants and peppers, again, plants that are in the same family. Um, you will see when you have a cabbage moth, or sorry, a tomato hornworm, that the, the veins of the leaves are present, but the leaf itself is gone. If you're seeing like half of your tomato plant without leaves, you probably have a hornworm somewhere on that plant. So look for it, hunt it out, pick it off. Um, if you happen to find one and you see these white little bumps on its back, there is a parasitic wasp that will lay, it's called a paper wasp, it lays its egg inside of the caterpillar and then the eggs will eat the caterpillar as they are growing. Leave that on the plant. Once there are wasp eggs in the caterpillar, they won't be eating any more of your plant. They are, they are about to die. Um, so you can leave those. But if you do find a uh, hornworm, you can, I kind of throw mine into the alley and let a bird find them and eat them. Um, moving on, the cabbage looper or the cabbage moth caterpillar um, is really common in the garden. It again feasts on our brassicas. You'll see, you'll know that they're there when you see holes all over your plants. Um, you can flip over the leaf and see them. Sometimes you can see them in different stages of growth. Remove them with your finger. Again, toss them away from the garden and birds will come and eat them. Um, in a very severe infestation, BT is an organic control, but I, I would recommend against that and again, encourage planting more flowers. Wasps will come, birds will come, and they will eat the caterpillars for you so you don't have to manage them yourself. And squirrels are a huge pest in the garden, not because they eat our plants, but because they dig them up and they eat our fruit. Um, you cannot build a fence that will keep a squirrel out. Um, you really just have to either live with them or think about ways that you can, you can help deter them. So, we have found garlic chili sprays. There's a link here um, for a recipe that helps to deter them. And there's also a product called Plant Skid and there's many other organic repellents that um, smell like predators. And so they will keep the, the squirrels away from the crops. Um, we also got a tip and this is something I haven't done myself. So I need to research it and see if it works. But that a lot of times when squirrels will take a bite out of a tomato and then leave the whole tomato there, um, they're not really trying to eat the tomato, they're thirsty. And so they're getting the water out of the tomato because it's a juicy fruit. Um, and so maybe we were, a suggestion that was made to us that if you leave a bowl of water out in the garden, um, I would change it out so that it doesn't become a mosquito breeding ground, but um, leave a bowl of fresh water in the garden and the squirrels will drink water instead of eating your tomatoes. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting solution. We'll see if it works. We'll have to try it this summer. And that brings us to our question and answer session. So um, if you have any questions, I know that some people have been using the chat throughout, but please, please let us know. We're here for you. Um, is it Jan Marie? You've done that? Um, yeah, I, I have a, um, like a ceramic dish that I would have in my community garden plot and, um, you know, kind of shallow. And um, yeah, I didn't even think about the squirrel part of it. I knew that I was promoting like, you know, uh, that I was like, I knew that I was giving the squirrels water and like um, butterflies or just whatever's out there water, but I didn't realize that that's why they might bite into a tomato. <laughs> Pretty cool. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Sure. Yeah. And I know we've grown, we've shared a lot of information with you all today. So, um, um how can you tell if a um, tomato plant is um, determinant or not? So, I've, I don't know a way, I, 
I don't know a way of telling if it's determinant by looking at it or indeterminate by looking at it. You will know like a month or two into the season when it's either absolutely huge or it kind of slows down and growing. The best way to know is know the name, the variety name of the tomato and do a Google search. And every seed catalog that sells tomato seeds will list if it's determinant or indeterminate. Um, you know, and, and those variety names are usually pretty consistent from seed company to seed company. So um, try to try your best to know the name of the tomato variety and just Google it. And then the link that you gave us for um, companion plants and crop rotation, like, do we have that so we can look at it? I'm sorry if I missed that information. Yeah, I put a link in the chat to a book actually on companion planting that just came out this past year that is based in research um, and is really interesting. The author is like trying to get away from a lot of kind of folk traditions of companion planting, which I actually find to be really fun and exciting and enjoy kind of those like indigenous ways of knowing and the, the historic ways that we've determined that plants do well or don't do well together. Um, but she's applying this kind of the scientific method to, to companion planting and using research. And she wrote a book about it. Um, and really the, the, the highlight of the book is build, creating more biodiversity in the garden is better. So anything that you can do to create more habitat for more insects, for different plants, for birds, for small mammals, the more balance there is in the garden, the, the better that your, your plants will do. Um, if you, know, you want to just sum the book up in three sentences. But yeah, to answer your question, all of the links we will um, be sharing out. We have a blog post. We'll send an email to everyone who registered. We'll have the recording of this session. We'll also have the um, all of the links will be from the session will be in that blog post as well. Sounds good. Um, one thing is um, I try to plant zinnias a little later in the season um, so that they'll be coming up in like, you know, they'll come, they will, they'll last until the first frost. But um, the, the problem is in August, you know, like nobody's around, like, and stuff just gets bone dry. Any suggestions for that? <laughs> Guess Sorry, not. I was muted. No, I mean, really, I would say that's where a watering schedule is really helpful. Um, you know, not everybody in Chicago goes on vacation in August. And so finding the people in your school community who the garden in August is abundant, right? That's when you've got tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, cucumbers, like beans, it's, they're all producing. Um, and so find the people who are hungry and give them access to your garden and, you know, help teach them where, how to use the water. Think about the custodial staff at your school, the, even the administrators at your school who have to be there every day in the summer, um, they might enjoy taking a 20 minute break and going outside and breathing for a little bit, getting some fresh air, putting some water, you know, not every principal will, but, but there, are a, there are a good amount of principals that we work with who are like, really enjoy that quiet, solitude on the schoolyard of getting to water the garden. So my suggestion would be just find, find the people who are there and, and uh, offer them food. I would, I would just add that if you're looking at just um, maintaining a flower bed, it might be helpful to um, invest in creating a sub irrigated planter bed. And I've had, um, schools in New York do that before where the entire base is just made up of um, water bottles and you're just kind of watering every two weeks so it doesn't require a lot of maintenance um, and those plants remain well watered um, when you're gone 
So we can definitely provide you with more information on how to build that out too. Thanks. Hi, Amina and Sam. This is uh, Salvador Perez, pre-K teacher at Boone Elementary School. Um, I just started uh, working uh, presentially since uh, January. So um, I've been planting with my kids on those beds. Um, and I just want to share with everybody else that I didn't have a way to identify the plants. So I didn't want to, to get them all out. So I started using Google pictures. So I started taking with the Google app, I just took the picture and Google was telling me what kind of plants were um, were there. So I didn't kill all of my plants. So that was working for me. That's something that I would like to share with everybody. Um, the other, I have a question. Are you are you guys going to be sharing um, seedlings and, and seeds with us this year? Okay. Yes, so we um, thank you for sharing that resource. So is it just the Google app? Somebody's asking and I'm inquiring as well. What? Yeah, um, when you're going to make a Google search, just go on your phone to Google. And if you're going to make a search, there is a little camera next to, next to the microphone. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. No, uh, the, uh, yeah. next to the wall, sir. You see that little camera right there? You just click uh -huh. on the camera. And, and and take a picture and it will tell you what, what kind of plant is that. Very cool. It will give you the okay. description, the definition, where they grow. Uh, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah. It was right. helping so a lot. We'll definitely add that to the research list. Thank you for sharing. No, not so a great. problem. Um, so yeah, we will discuss seeds and seedling distribution once we're done with our Q&A session. Um, so, thank you so much. And I wanna be mindful of our time. I know we said we'd be wrapping up about now. I think maybe we can take a couple more, like maybe one more question and then we'll move on to, to wrapping up and sharing that information about the distribution and all of that. Uh, for the flowers and uh, seniors and nas, Tritium or something like that. Uh, it has to be inside or uh, for seedlings or outside directly to the soil. It is so the both. both. Yeah, both would work. I would say now that the weather is warm, I would as long as you can keep the soil outside well mo well moistened and you know not dry, not kind of have a lot of fluctuation between wet and dry. Um, planting them directly outside, I think will will give you the best growth because the roots don't have to be disturbed to move them from inside to outside, right? The plants are just growing where they are in their place. They will be adapted and accustomed to those conditions. You don't have to harden them off. Um, I think just dress seeding them. So yeah, zinnias, sunflowers, nasturtium, um, bachelor's buttons, calendula, marigolds, right? Like all of the common garden flowers, um, I, I would just direct these straight into the garden right now. But of course you can start them inside and move them out. I start some inside, but the grow was very slow. But now- Yeah, some, it depends on the flowers. Some flowers, and it really depends on the plant, right? Some flowers like to have different temperatures um, or specific temperatures that they germinate at. Um, some flowers, just er, herbs germinate very slowly, right? Like oregano, rosemary, those are plants that could, might take three weeks before they germinate. Um, but, you know, the, most of the plants, the seeds that we're sharing with you all, the zinnia, the bachelor's buttons, the sunflowers, those, those germinate pretty, pretty easily. Those, we, we try not to give you all too many challenges and, um, you know, pick out the flowers and herbs that are very difficult. That's a good question. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen again and we will, um, we will wrap up our workshop.
Alrighty, so now um, information about our seedling and seed distribution. So thankfully this year we are having one and it's going to be held over um, the weekend of June 5th through the 6th. So um, we've emailed our network out with um, a seedling request form. So if you've completed that form, um, you were required to sign up for a pickup time um, during those two days. Um, we're asking folks to complete the form with only one individual per school. So reaching out to your um, team and assigning an individual who's gonna take on that role of both completing the form and picking up the seeds and seedlings. Um, so the seedlings that we are providing this year are collards, charred kale, green onions, um, two types of pepper, one sweet and one hot, two types of tomatoes and sweet potatoes, slips. And then um, for schools that currently don't have herbs growing in their garden, whether it be they have never received them for some reason or they were pulled out, um, we have a select number of herb bundles available to those schools. So, which includes oregano, thyme, sage, rosemary, chives, and um, basil. Um, so if you have any questions to, uh, um, for us regarding the seedling distribution, um, feel free to contact us at our Chicago program email, Chicago program at biggreen.org. Um, and we will email folks that have completed the form and registered with their um, information regarding their pickup time as well as the pickup location. So um, that is at Christie Weber Landscapes. Um, and we're gonna um, have signs at the site directing to you um, to where on site um, you can pick, pick up your seedlings. So all of that information will be sent out um, closer to next week. Um, so for folks that are interested in acquiring resources that we have not supplied um, in our um, seedling and seed distribution, some great organizations to reach out to um, for those resources includes um, Farm on Ogden, CCGA, and the plant, which have um, seeds and seedlings available in select times throughout the year. Um, for free. And then if you're looking to purchase seeds, um, the Plant Sweetwater Foundation and Urban Growers Collective, as well as City Grange, makes those, um, has those seeds and seedlings available. Um, and it's just something to ke keep a lookout in terms of garden, in between garden networks, our local seed swaps, such as the season late May, early June, is generally when those happen. Um, and if you are looking um, to um, extend a request out to your lo local um, hardware store, whether it's Lowe's or Home Depot, um, they can provide donations to um, your local um, schools with seeds and seedlings. Um, you simply have to um, just show that you are affiliated with an organization or a school um, and sometimes, um, depending on uh, the location, they'll ask if you can follow up with a letter or um, a picture of how you use those resources. So um, many different options in terms of how um, to get some additional resources um, for your learning garden. And we do have a link to a template to request donation in our follow-up blog post as well that we'll be sharing. Right, um, so in terms of big green supports this season, oh. um, so um, we, this is our last workshop of the school year. 
However, this summer we have partnered up with um, Face to Face um, and our parent network to hold um, a summer garden series um, in which we will be covering different um, uh, garden how to's um, uh, every two weeks th throughout the summer. So that will start um, in the middle of June and extend all the way um, into August, covering things from biodiversity, watering your garden and soil health. So just something to keep a lookout if you're interested in attending um, garden workshops over the summer. Um, so we are still providing schools with our virtual um, supports um, until the school year is um, over. So if you are still looking to plant um, your summer garden or trying to find uh, how best to harvest out your spring garden, um, please reach out to us um, through our one-on-one -on -one garden planning um, meetings and reach out to myself and Sam. Um, we can um, provide you with um, virtual as well as some in-person garden visits um, depending on the request. And there's plenty of online lessons and resources available on our website, um, both at Big Green dot org and big green at home um, and um, we have reached out to schools in the past um, who are interested in um, uh, uh, providing um, their their growing community with grow kits so if you are still interested either it be this season or come fall, please reach out to us with that request so we can make it available to you in the future um, as they become available. Yeah, and will those of you who responded that you're interested in the survey um, where you also requested resources like seedlings from us that we'll be distributing on the fifth and the sixth, um, we'll be following up with you as soon as those are available. Um, it, might, it might be a little bit later over the summer rather than um, right, rather than during the spring. And then, oh, one other thing, we haven't, um, we didn't announce this in the beginning, but our Big Green program team is now Amina and myself, um, and we will be hiring very shortly. And so if there's anybody in your network that you think would be excellent for doing this work, supporting all of your school gardens, um, please keep a lookout for um, that job description. Um, we're, we're looking to get ourselves back up to a full team by, by the fall so that we can be there for you, with you, as you're welcoming students back to the garden and back to your classrooms for the fall season. Um, so that really kind of brings us to the end. As we mentioned, we do have uh, CPDU credits available for this workshop. Um, Amina can put the link to our evaluation into the chat. Um, it's a PDF that you can fill the form out um, and email it back to us. Please, when you send that back, include in your email your school name, your Illinois educator ID number, um, which if you do not have, you do not know your Illinois educator ID number, also Amina just added that link into the chat as well. Um, that will that will kind of be processed in the next week or so. So please get it back to us quickly, um, and we'll we'll get those credits to you. We'll reply with a uh, evidence of completion. Um, we mentioned earlier, please sign up to pick up summer supplies. That includes summer seeds that you'll be able to pick out from a wide selection of seeds what you need. Um, summer seedlings that include herbs and vegetables. Um, cover crop seeds, flower seeds, and we also have four bags of compost available for everyone who signs up if you need compost for your garden. Um, and that will be Saturday and Sunday, June 5th and 6th. Some of the time slots have already filled up. Um, and so please just select on the survey what is available. That link again is in the chat. And that will be at Christy Weber Landscape's um, main headquarters at 2900 West Ferdinand Street in uh in, in uh, humble park 
Um, it's a little bit kind of out of the way and hard to see. It's kind of in a frontage road behind the old Center for Neighborhood Technology there. Um, but we'll have signs up to help direct you to where we're at. Um, and again, if you are interested in getting in touch with me and Amina and you're used to reaching out to Alana or Catherine or Sean or um, Marla or any of the other amazing garden educators, program coordinators who have been on our team um, and don't have Amina and my emails handy, we did create this Chicago program at Big Green that we're monitoring daily to make sure that everybody has access to Amina and I and our support throughout the season. Um, Thank you all so much for joining. I can stay on for another minute or two if anybody has any questions, but that wraps up our workshop for today. Thank you all so much for coming.